£100,000. Now on BBC One, Crime Watch UK with Nick Ross and Fiona Bruce. Tonight, a case that is particularly close to our hearts. A year ago next week, Jill Dando, the presenter of this programme, was murdered. On Crime Watch, we always say your call counts, and however unlikely it seems, you may discover there are new ways you can help. It seemed unreal last year to be appealing for information about Jill's shooting, and uh, I can tell you it feels no less surreal tonight. But the deepest impact, of course, was felt by her fiancé, Alan Farthing, who's here as a guest in the studio tonight and by her family in and around her birthplace of Western Supermare, and most of all, her father, Jack. The last time I saw Jill was when I went up to see the specialist about having this eye operation. My eyesight was getting steadily worse. So Jill arranged to have a private consultation for me. One of the main reasons was the wedding, and I thought that I was going to have my eyesight much better so that I could have walked her up the aisle. But uh, it didn't work out that way. Jill, can you do the news now, look? <laughs> Getting married and possibly having children was what Jill had always wished for. It was probably more important than anything that happened in her career. It just seems so cruel that something like this could have happened when Jill was so happy and at the, the, the happiest time of her life. Jill, can you do the news now, look? <laughs> can you do the news? The BBC television presenter Jill Dando has been murdered outside her London home. She was found by a friend with severe head injuries just before noon in the doorway of her house. I was having my lunch. I didn't have the radio on. And the telephone went. And I got up to answer it, and that was Doreen, my next door neighbour. She said, Oh, Jack, she said, I got some terrible news. Oh, I said, What's that? And she said, I've just heard on the news, the one o'clock news, that Jill has been murdered. I still had the operation because I had to think about the uh, memorial service. On the day when Jill and Alan were due to get married, we all separately went up to the uh, cemetery. Just as we were about to leave, um, Alan turned up um, and he brought um, the most fabulous, fabulous bouquet that he was taking to the grave. and. Um, it was just awful to think that, you know, this was supposed to be their, the wedding day that they'd both been so excited about. I've come to the conclusion that, you no, know, they, they will get somebody one day. But uh, when, I just don't know, but I'm living in hopes that uh, one day he will be caught. It is one year on, but this investigation will not stop. There have been many theories, conspiracy theories, contract killings, but what I want to do is to put all that to one side and look at one very strong possibility, that Jill was killed by a person working on his own. And I would like to look at the events which took place on the 26th of April and on some of the previous Mondays beforehand. I would like to look at the gun and the ammunition. And my appeal tonight is to the person responsible for killing Jill. And there's a very strong probability that he's watching this programme tonight. On the 26th of April last year, there are a number of sightings of a person hanging around in Gowan Avenue, in Fulham, outside the address where Jill Dando lived. 
that a man was seen on two previous Mondays before the 26th. I noticed a man standing outside the nursery school. I was going to a cafe in Munster Road for breakfast. I was in the cafe about 35 to 40 minutes and when I left and started walking south down Munster Road he was still standing outside the nursery school. As I walked through the gateway I noticed a man was now standing on the south side of Waldo Avenue at the junction with Munster Road by the tea shop. I left the house to go down the bookies on the Fulham Palace Road. I realised that the man that I'd seen a week earlier was now standing at a junction of Waldo Avenue and Silbury Street. And when I came back 20 minutes later, he was still standing where I'd seen him. As I was walking down Silbury Street, I saw the same man again. He sort of got a bit agitated and tried to hide his face while looking straight down at the pavement. Then on the morning of the 26th of April, a mother was driving her son to school in Gowan Avenue and she saw a man wearing a Trilby type hat. Watch him, Mum. He was looking up like he was waiting for something. He had the worst ill-fitting suit on that you could imagine. Well, he is a funny one. I was in Bishop's Road waiting to cross Munster Road. Out of the corner of my eye, there was a man outside the double glazing shop. He looked out of context in every way. His clothes didn't fit, his hat didn't fit, and he acted very strangely. About an hour later, in Gowan Avenue and Munster Road, two other witnesses saw a man whom they both describe as wearing glasses which were far too big for him. There are some differences in these descriptions, but there are lots of similarities. We have a dozen witnesses describing a man in his 30s or 40s, tall, wearing a dark suit, and agitated. Three of them said his suit was too big. Another three saw him in a Trilby hat. Several mentioned the mobile phone. He is the main person that we wish to speak to in this investigation. Jill Dando was shot between 11.30 and 11.35 on the 26th of April last year. She was shot once behind her left ear and the gun was in hard contact with her head. This was a violent, aggressive and appalling act against someone who had done no harm to anyone ever. There were no witnesses to the shooting, but two neighbours heard her scream and she must have seen her attacker in those last few seconds. Immediately after the shooting, a neighbour saw a man leaving the gate area of Jill Dando's house. Again, he was in his 30s or 40s, tall, with dark hair and baggy trousers. And a second neighbour saw the same man go down Gowan Avenue towards Fulham Palace Road. Left behind at the crime scene was the cartridge case and the bullet. It's a 9mm short or 380 calibre cartridge case made by Remington in the USA uh, on or after July 1994. Well, the, the cartridge case has six small, almost like pin pricks, round the case. Uh, these are stab crimps, which we think we used to hold the bullet in place. Uh, as you can see, they were made by a, a sharp tool, possibly uh, the tip of a short nail or a, an automatic center punch. Well, what is crimping? It's primarily to hold the bullet in the cartridge case. In this situation, what has he done? Has he found another bullet to put onto the cartridge case? Has the original bullet become loose? Or has he taken the bullet out and added powder or removed powder? Whatever the circumstances, he has knowledge of firearms and he has knowledge of the cartridge case to be able to do that and crimp it. We can tell from examination of the bullet that it was fired in a barrel that wasn't conventionally rifled. Uh, and we think it's likely that the gun that was used was a gun that was uh, originally deactivated and then criminally reconverted uh, using uh, a smooth bored barrel. Well, clearly he's had to get the gun from somewhere. Handguns have been banned since 1997. So did he own the gun before that date? Or did he get possession of it shortly before the 26th of April? Has someone else received that gun after the 26th of April? So how can our appeal help you recognise the man who killed Jill Dando? He's someone who clearly has an interest in guns and firearms, experience in using them or handling them. 
and that can come from being a gun club member or perhaps from his occupation or previous occupation. Very likely to have specialist magazines relating to guns or ammunition. How old is he? We can't be precise, but very likely between 30s and 40s, and that's certainly what the witnesses say who saw the man in the street. Was the Chilby hat and the glasses a disguise, or is that what the person normally wears? He's very likely to be alone, perhaps a loner, someone who's emotionally isolated. He's very likely to have had an interest in Jill Dando. What does this remind you of? Or if not Jill, an unhealthy attraction, infatuation or obsession with other women. And what's more, we know men like that who become infatuated with people like Jill Dando. And that in turn turns to hate and resentment. This was not a random act. This was planned. The person arranged to be there. He knew the address. He was in the street that morning with the handgun. He had been able to take himself out of his ordinary routine to be there that Monday morning. What about the previous occasions when a man was seen in Gowan Avenue? The two Mondays and the Wednesdays before she was shot. That all takes planning. The murder took place at 11.30. Could the person you think of now been there at 11.30? from where they travelled. How long would it take to travel to Fulham and back? The worst thing with seeing the film clip of Jill's last moments was the fact that she was just going about doing the ordinary things that Jill did. And the fact that you do want to almost be able to stop the camera and stop the action and say to her, you know, shout at her and say, Jill, don't go home. Amen. If only the tape could be rewound. But Hamish, you really have now narrowed down this appeal quite a lot. We have. And what we're trying to say tonight is link these things together. The loner, the obsession with Jill Dando, the obsession with firearms, the ability to be in that street at that time on that Monday and previous Mondays, and the description. All together, they make sense. Alone and separate, they don't. Now, what do you mean by a loner? We all know people who are you know, not very gregarious. Do you mean, you know, as, as that witness said, a bit of a funny one? Yes, there is something odd about him, but he might be alone, but isolated, either emotionally isolated, not married, having difficulty with previous relationships with girlfriends. There will be an obviousness about this, this separate, separate away from society and groups of people. And when you say obsessional about Jill, I mean, yes. millions of people are fans of Jill, but you mean something very, very particular. Yes, we're not talking about respected admiration, the ordinary fan. This is an unhealthy interest in Jill Dando. Yes. And more importantly, it's unlikely to have been kept a secret. There will have been some telltale signs. Anyone in yes. particular? The example is the man who pretended to be her brother and was trying to get arrange her utilities to him. We know a number of people who have been eliminated, who have displayed this obsession, wanted to meet her, wanted to see her. That's the individual, but link it with the loner. Now you've said that you've at least one suspect who's been through, who didn't appear to any of his friends to have an obsession with Jill, but had an astonishing one when you looked into it. I mean, could there be more people like that? Presumably there are. There, I'm, I'm sure there are. I know there are. And if, even if there isn't an obsession with Jill Dando, it's an obsession with other women, previous relationships, or an obsession with something else. And that's where we talk about the obsession with guns or other features. So people would know, even if they weren't sure they had an obsession with Jill, he would be odd. And yes. couldn't he have kept the obsession about guns, this interest in guns secret? I don't think so. I mean, gun, handguns were banned in 1997. This won't have just started this obsession with guns, this interest, this ability to alter or change them. So a previous gun club member, this interest with guns and perhaps specialist books and magazines. So people need to look back in time, link guns, link loner, link obsession to Jill or other odd behaviour with women. And do you think he's watching now? I do. I feel sure he's watching now. And what I also know is nothing has been resolved by this killing and it won't be resolved. But there's one opportunity, and he can ring us now here in Crime Watch, he can ring the inquiry team and speak to somebody. There is detail in this crime which we know, and only he will know, and he must ring us now, and I feel sure that will resolve it. If he's going to ring, he needs to give you a detail that's not public, you're saying? Yes. Well, 
There you are. Please think about relatives though, friends, acquaintances, anyone who fits any part of that pattern. Put these bits together. Let's then firmly eliminate whoever you can think of. Not only might you solve this terrible crime, but there's still the biggest reward in British criminal history waiting to be claimed, a quarter of a million pounds. 0500 600 600 or call the instant room directly on 0181 246 0732. An appeal on last month's crime watch was the centrepiece of a big police operation into the racist murder of Stephen Lawrence in South London. A call in response to the programme led directly to the widely reported discovery of a knife and an iron bar buried in the back garden of a local house. There were also three arrests and several other important new pieces of information. Following an attack on a woman at the Worthington Cup final, calls to Crime Watch suggested a name. A man later walked into a London police station and has been charged. Six months ago, we showed photos of an anti-capitalism riot in the city of London. As a result of calls to Crime Watch, one man has been charged with violent disorder. And police want your help again after a similar riot in November, this time in the Euston area of London. If you know one of these faces, give us a call. An armed robber who takes care to disguise himself, or so he thought. Take a look at this. He's in Shrewsbury in Shropshire just under a month ago, holding up a building society. You can see his face clearly, but there's more to come. In a nearby shopping mall, off comes a disguise, hat and gloves into the bin, and what gives him away is that he's completely bald. His jacket and jeans were found later, and here they are. Now it's a fairly distinctive two-tone jacket and regular jeans from CNA. The same man held up staff at a building society in Abergavenny and left this college scarf behind. This is what he may look like without the hat. Have another look. Call 01495 232 268. And another face, this time from a bank in Hornchurch, Essex. Now this man is cashing a cheque stolen from an elderly patient at a nearby hospital. Her bag was actually rifled while she lay critically ill. In fact, sadly, she's since died. Nice man, this. Please tell us who he is. Call 01708 751 212. And two faces caught in the lobby at Lloyds Bank in Frimley in Surrey. They were using cash cards stolen in a burglary earlier the same day, and they managed to get £300. The accomplice has black hair, but look at the distinctive crown. And the one using the card has short hair, hair too, but it's lighter and he's wearing glasses. Tell us who these two are. Call 01483 227006. We all know the feeling after a nightmare. You wake up in the morning and you think, thank goodness for that. But what if it wasn't? One woman realised that the images in her nightmare were real. We've pieced together what happened from her flashbacks. I remember thinking, oh my God, what am I doing on her doorstep? Um, I need to go home. I think it was something where instincts took over and I just got up, walked down the path. I'd heard about this sort of thing before it happened to me, but you still don't think, you still don't think that it's going to happen to you. I think I was drugged and kidnapped by someone and raped by two people. Just turn your head for a second, whatever they did, you know, put a, something in my drink, or whatever, and um, you're gone, basically. It started 11 months ago on a Thursday after work in London's West End. Several friends who were temping had arranged to meet up for an evening drink at the busy pitcher and piano bar on William IV Street, just off Trafalgar Square. I mean, it was, it was a Thursday night, so we weren't, I had work the next day, so we were just going out for a few. Nothing out of the ordinary, we were just going for a drink. <laughs> After a few hours, they made the short walk to Leicester Square, where they had a bite to eat. They then decided to head off to a bar, the Little Havana. Good evening, ladies. Hello. Um, how much is it? Just be pound to come inside. Oh, come on. We really want to stay for a drink. We're not going to be here oh, long. Please, oh, please, please. Come inside. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.
to be honest, we were so engrossed in what, what we were talking about, I didn't really notice anything out of the ordinary until later it got much more packed. I think we had a bottle of wine between four of us. You know, it was very much in the back of your mind that you had work the next day and we were going to go. <laughs> there was a guy there and um, he was dancing around and just hovering around our table basically and um, he started coming up and talking to the four of us. <laughs> One of the girls had lived in Italy for a couple of years so she was asking where he was from. An Italian man in the little Havana a year ago. Was it you? You don't watch your glass all the time, you don't think that's going to happen. I've thought and thought and thought how it could have happened or where it was done or and I just it doesn't make any sense at all. We realised it was getting later and um, we had a bottle of red wine between the four of us. So the other two girls had to go and catch their last train. So they ran off and uh, it was me and one other. I wasn't aware of anything, there wasn't any build up to, I wasn't feeling woozy. It's just a straight curtains come down, blackout. Basically it was like someone just hit you over the head. It's all really, really, really hazy there. I remember making the decision that we were leaving and um, I remember walking out of the little Havana bar and there's a big block from there. It's not clear what happened after that, though both girls were caught on camera entering the Equinox nightclub. Neither remembers going in there or to any other bar or club. Next thing we're in a place with flashing lights, disco-ish sort of place or club. I remember being in a um, toilet somewhere. I've no idea where it was uh, with this guy. I don't remember meeting anyone. I remember being scared that I didn't know where my friend was. It's like black and then suddenly you see an image. Her attacker was medium build, mid-twenties, shoulder length, greasy black hair with a strong East European accent. Next thing I remember has been in the back of a car. Um, I remember seeing Hope and Tube Station outside and I think I was probably thinking, you know, I'm going further and further away from home. And uh, with this presence next to me, um, uh, suddenly from one guy there's two guys. I knew I was in danger. But, I mean, I remember um, walking down a road, going up a pathway and being on a doorstep. He was um, definitely of Eastern European origin. His build, he was a, big, a bigger build than the other guy. Quite, quite stocky and he had a shaved head. I, m I remember senses more than feelings. I remember the smell, I remember the weight of someone on me. The victim was left on a doorstep in Minster Road in Cricklewood. From there, she walked 100 yards to a 24-hour garage on the Kilburn High Road, where she got help. The police think the garage could be one often used by the attackers. Now, Jane, first of all, how can we be sure that the woman wasn't just drunk, that she was, in fact, drugged? Well, we know how much she'd had to drink that night, no, and we no, also know that her behaviour was out of character. Um, she's also displaying symptoms of someone who had been drugged in this way. She had flashbacks, gaps in the memory, and she was never unconscious at any point. One of the problems is that the gut drugs do go out of the system quite quickly, um, and people also may think that our victims don't remember anything of it, but they do. She obviously has some very clear images in her mind. The first attack in the toilet, what about that? We're not clear where that happened, are we? No, we're not sure where it happened. We do know that she went into the Equinox at one point, but it may have happened in any toilet, in any pub or club within that area. Um, and we're just appealing also to anyone that may have seen them. It may even have been a staff toilet. Now, the Italian man that we saw in that bar, the Little Havana, you want to talk to him? 
Yes, we don't actually believe he's connected in any way, but he may be a regular to the Little Havana, he may have seen something, or he may know something about the attack, and we'd like him to come forward. Now, it's pretty clear from what the woman said that there's an Eastern European connection here as far as her attackers are concerned. Yes, and we also think there's a connection with the Kilburn and Cricklewood areas, where there is a large Eastern community in that area. We would also appeal to anyone within that community who may know something of the attack, know the people involved, we'd like them to come forward. We do have two DNA profiles as well, so if any names do come forward, we can very easily eliminate anyone from our inquiry. We'd also like to appeal to other victims of these two men. We'd like them to come forward as well if they believe that they have been subjected to this, this kind of attack. Now, in terms of, of, of women watching this film and thinking, what can I do to avoid this kind of thing ever happening to me? It's pretty difficult, isn't it? Because you can't guarantee you're going to leave your drink unattended in a club or something somewhere like that. Yes, I think if nothing else, the fact that they should raise their awareness, having seen this programme tonight, but if they have left their drink unattended for any length of time, consider getting a fresh one. If they feel that they're um, being subjected to, to a feeling that, and they haven't had a lot to drink, then go to someone that you can trust. You know, these effects can take 15 to 20 minutes to actually kick in, so they do have time to go, someone if, to go to someone if they need to. Above all, if you think you've been a victim, report it. We will take you seriously. OK, Jane, well, let's see what we can do tonight. Call the studio on 0500 600 600 or the incident room on 0171 321 7618. And if you've been a victim of any crime and you need to talk, call Victim Support Line. There'll be someone there till 2 a.m. 0845 30 30 900. Four years ago, we appealed about the stabbing of Stephen Cameron on an M25 slip road in Kent. The Old Bailey was told that a car valet called Crime Watch after finding a knife in a vehicle belonging to Kenneth Noy. As you'll have seen, Kenneth Noy has now been found guilty of Stephen's murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. Last month, we showed a clay head reconstructed from the body of a man dumped beside a road in Sheffield. In the publicity surrounding the Crime Watch programme, someone rang police to say it was a perfect likeness of a man who'd gone missing three years ago. As a direct result, two men have been charged with murder. Now, into March, a dramatic assault caught on camera in a hospital car park. A man had been visiting a friend at St James's Hospital in Leeds, better known as Jimmy's. When he came out, he was seen haranguing a group of men. One of them got out a baseball bat and left him with a fractured skull. Now, unfortunately, it's too violent to show all the footage, but take a good look at the attacker. He's wearing a South African rugby union shirt, and at the time, he was using a black Nissan microcar with a number plate D330DEF. That car has changed hands several times, but all the other owners have been traced and eliminated from the inquiry. If you know him, ring 0113 241 3685. Now, this woman is going out on a spending spree. Over six separate days, she uses credit cards in several different names. She buys chocolates, sports goods, a stereo, children's clothes, mobile phones and watches. Now, at least once, she fled into a silver Renault Megane with the registration S780KJF. Now, she's white and the driver is black. So, who is she and who is he? And where is that silver Megane? S780KJF. Call 0181 246 0320. Now, we've had some encouraging calls on our reappeal uh, in the murder of Jill Dando. Um, we've got ten names suggested so far, many of them may have links to gun clubs, and three names of infatuated fans, so some good progress there. Now, we all know when it's Grand National Day, even if we aren't big racing fans. I had a bet a week or so ago, but as usual I didn't win anything. It's a fun day out for lots of people in Liverpool. But four years ago, on the day of the race, just five minutes from Aintree, Pauline Johnson was knocked down by a hit-and-run driver. She was on a Pelican crossing just outside her home in Walton. The car was a blue m -Reg Ford Mondeo and there were four people inside. It stopped briefly before driving off towards Bootle. Pauline was taken to hospital but died ten days later. And with me now is Pauline's husband, Bill Johnson. Bill, thanks so much for coming in. We can see a picture here behind us of Pauline. Yep. Um, your son, Peter, was just six months old That's when she right, was yeah. killed, and he's, yes. he's what, he's four now? He's four now. So how's he coping with it all? Well, um, he's doing quite well, really, but he, he hasn't got a mum. He knows there's something different, and um, 
we need to find an explanation for him. And how do you explain to him where his mother is now? Well, at the moment, he's told that his, his mum is an angel. She lives on a cloud and she's in heaven. And on special days, such as uh, Mother's Day, we write messages on a balloon and we send them off. And that's how we tell mummy that. That's where him. his mother is. Yeah. Now, who are you appealing to tonight specifically? I'd like to appeal to the passengers. Um, they know what's happened. They've, they're in a position now to end this nightmare that me and Pauline have. There's a time going to come when Peter's going to know, want to know what's happened to his mother. They can come forward and they can tell us. Of course, there were four people in the car. There were two men and two women. So if any of them That's come right. forward? Yeah, any of them. If they, if they can come forward and bring our nightmare to an end. And of course, they're, they're bound to have spoken to other people. Yes. So if they've spoken to other people in the last four years, we want to hear from them too. Yes. Anybody that, anybody that, that, that thinks that they have heard anything, in, re, however remote it may be, please contact the police and they can decide the value of it. And that is, they are the only ones who can bring it to an end. And they can also stop the suffering of their own family because their own family must be suffering now as well. OK, Bill, let's hope we can sort this out. Let me just remind you about the car. It was an Isis Blue M Reg Ford Mondeo. Part of the valance, that's the bit that goes under the bumper, that was left on the road. And we know it had been repaired in the past. If you know anything about that car, or you were in it, pick up the phone. If not for Bill and his son Peter, then for the £5,000 reward offered by the Liverpool Echo. Ring 0151 treble 7 5730. Or call Crime Stoppers, anonymous if you want, on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. And that's good for any case. Last month, out of the blue, there were two separate attacks on security vans on the same road, 250 yards apart. Not surprisingly, detectives reckon that they're linked. They even have some ideas about who might be responsible. And they've had a good bit of local cooperation. They hope that this reconstruction will prompt others in the know. Mid-February, Chepstow in South Wales, and a Toyota Hiace was stolen from an industrial estate. Do you know someone who acquired a van like this and kept it for a fortnight. In the back were industrial tools. What happened to them? Were they sold on or simply dumped? Maybe the van had been kept here on the Hlanromney estate on the eastern edge of Cardiff. At any rate, this is where it reappeared seven weeks ago on a Thursday afternoon outside the local council housing office. It now had false number plates. I've done the job now for 31 years. I like the job, or you wouldn't do it for 31 years. I get pleasure out of it, satisfaction out of it. I think that the um, times have changed from when I started. The simple reason is there is there's no respect today. Ron around me is a bad place, but see, if you're doing your job right and you've got all your gear and you do what you've been taught to do, you should be safe. Well, the way we were taught years ago was you've got what everybody else wants and if they can take it off you, they will. If you don't enter, you don't win, do you? But that's all done there now. See you next week then. You're always expecting the unexpected. You always got to keep that in the back of the mind. Go! <laughs> well, there's, there's not a lot you can think about. It's how fast they can hit you. It leaves you with a, you know, a bad taste in your mouth. You, know, you think you think you let people down, but being old school, you do got a tendency to blame yourself. The cash box was protected by a smoke bomb, but it failed to detonate. The van was dumped two streets away in Milverton Avenue, and the empty cash box was left behind. But the fire in the Toyota failed to take hold. 
Someone in Llan Romney must know where the three men ran. Three weeks went past to a Saturday afternoon, the 25th of March. A few minutes from the shops in Llan Romney is the ABC park on the St. Melons estate. And the residents there were treated that afternoon to the noise of a biker showing off to onlookers. Two hours later, back at Llan Romney shops, another green bike was seen, but this time we know a lot about it. It was a Kawasaki 900 that had been stolen eight months before. It had gold Allen screws, a gold brake disc, gold trims on the handlebars, and a non-standard silencer. Well, there's a lot of people around, and obviously it was Saturday afternoon, busiest time of the day, really. And a lot of children around. Because yeah. the more people around, the, the less possibility you're going to get attacked, really. I mean, it's always in the back of your mind. You're always watching, trying to um, observe and whatever. But you never think, oh, it's going to happen to me, because you, it's one of those things, you, know, you just uh, don't think about it. I mean, if you thought about it, you wouldn't do the job. I heard that motorcycle revving up, and I just didn't think. All those people around, I thought, no. Quite busy, for, you know, just Saturday. I was putting shopping into the footwell of my car, and um, this boy pushed past me, and I just thought he was so rude. When I, when I saw him, I thought, I can't believe this. Well, I, I didn't want him to get the money, but on the other hand, I didn't want him to do any more damage to me. He didn't put up a fight because he didn't stand a chance. It was hard to explain, really. It was as if I was someone else. It wasn't there. It was just happening to someone else, you know? It's the macho thing, isn't it, really? You think to myself, well, you should have done this, you should have done that. Once again, the robbers were plain lucky. Again, the booby trap device failed to explode. Back towards the St. Melons estate. The bike was dumped, along with the now empty cash box, at Trowbridge Green. Minutes afterwards, a red car left Trowbridge Green. Now, was that connected to the robbery? Could it have been the getaway vehicle? And if not, whose was it? Also, this man, with his shopping, stood and watched the second robbery at Countersbury Avenue. Now, if you might just recognise yourself, if so, you could be a key witness. And to make it worth your while, there is a reward. DI Gary Sullivan and his team are here waiting for your call. 0500 600 600 here in the studio or 01 222 774 280. On Christmas Eve last year, Sid Carr forced his way into an ex-girlfriend's car and made her drive for several miles. After she escaped, he drove the vehicle straight at her. Do you know where he is tonight? He's 38, 5 foot 10, with a West Country accent and a scar above his left ear. And usually he works as a labourer on building sites. That's Sid Carr. Please ring 01908 686 000. And this is Khalid Radman, nickman, nicknamed Ammo. Now he's wanted in connection with a whole series of offences on Merseyside. Drug peddling, an attack on a cash delivery guard, a burglary and a car theft. He's mixed race, 19 years old, with a strong Liverpool accent. Just tell us where he is tonight, 0151 777 Back in February, a young man was lured to a flat in West London where he was shot until the gun ran out of ammunition and then he was stabbed repeatedly. Now we want to speak to Stuart Daniel Blake, a tenant of the flat where the attack happened. He's tall, 27 years old, with short brown hair. He likes gambling and has connections in Aberdeen and London. Now astonishingly, the young man survived, though he may never walk again. So tell us where Stuart Daniel Blake is tonight. 0171 321 8651. 
and another horrifying crime. A 20-year-old from Somalia, Anwar Ahmed, was trussed up and killed. Now, we'd like to speak to Mohamed Bile, but he has disappeared. Mr. Bile is also from Somalia, and that may well be the key to where he's hiding. If you know where he is, please call 0171 321 9640. You, know, you can also ask to speak to a Somalian community leader if you wish. In March last year, we reconstructed events surrounding the terrible murders of dog breeders Janice and Connie Sheridan in their Norfolk cottage. A car number plate we showed was spotted by a caller to Crime Watch and eventually led police to arrest Kevin Cotterell. He's now been sentenced to two life terms. A Crime Watch case sold by forensic scientists. Laura Donnelly was murdered as she walked home from a nightclub in Paisley. DNA screening identified a local man, Thomas Brophy, as the murderer. He's been sentenced to life. And advances in genetic science led to the reopening of the case of Mary Gregson, killed 23 years ago in Shipley. A local man's now been charged with her murder. In the same program, we showed a hoard of hot property, goods thought to be stolen but not linked to specific burglaries. As a result of calls, 35 items were returned to their owners and two men have together been charged with 32 counts of handling stolen goods. Four simple clues, see if you can put them together. A white van man and three distinctive shirts. The white van is a Ford Transit. The man looks something like this, and the three shirts are like these. A white shirt with New Zealand written on it, a blue and white striped rugby top, and a t-shirt with a pattern very much like this. The link is a man who's been attacking women from Northampton to Hampshire. They're serious sexual assaults in which he grabs victims near trunk roads and industrial estates. The M3 near Farnborough, the A1 near St Neots, and Buzziat on the A509, just off the M1. I have never been so scared in my life. During the attack, he kept saying, make me feel good. Um, he would let me go. Who is he? This is how one of his victims describes him, and it's the clearest impression so far. But this is how he looked to another woman he attacked. We need to find him quickly. Paul Speck, you've got some pretty powerful clues now. Yes, we know an awful lot about this attacker and I'm confident that a relative or friend or work colleague or girlfriend will be able to put the pieces of the jig jigsaw together and hopefully give us a name. For this man must be caught because he will attack again. There's a white van driver, at least you think it's a white van. Well, it could be light in coloured, it could be a metallic colour, but we know it's transit style and size, not necessarily a Ford Transit. we don't know it's his, presumably, either. No, it could be hired vehicle. It certainly had black markings uh, in the form of writing and lines on the driver's side. So he could be a courier driver, delivery driver, or it could be rented. Now, the, the, the offender himself is, is chubby. We've seen that from, from the, the drawings. What else do you know about him? I think he could be described as being unfit. His stomach certainly overhangs his trousers, and he's aged in his late twenties, early thirties. His average height about five foot eight, five foot ten, and he's got short, blonde to brown hair. The t-shirt that he wore was very distinctive, as was a pair of shoes that he was wearing. Was he clean? Was he smelly? Was he a smoker? I mean, there was like? no smell of tobacco. He was clean. His t-shirt was well worn and well washed, uh, but he was of general good appearance. Good accent. No uh, discernible accent, but we believe it's from the southern part of England. OK, well, there's a lot there to put together. And, of course, the fear is that these attacks may become more severe. They've already been going on for two years, so please, let's put a stop to them tonight. Call the studio or call 01604 zero. These are crimes that can be solved. Our numbers are on CFAX page 621, or you can email us at crimewatchuk at the BBC. Well, we're having... Uh, huge volume of calls, especially on the reappeal about the Jill Dando murder. I have to say we're still getting a lot of people who are offering us theories, which aren't very helpful at the moment. The police have spent over 11 months going through theories. What they now need is names, but we have got a lot of names coming in. A lot of them are linking guns with an obsession with Jill. And uh, we'll tell you more on Cromwich Update at 11.10. If that's beyond your bedtime, well, please join us next month. Remember, we're on Wednesdays from now on. That's Wednesday, May the 24th. Don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.
Here's a nice story about false teeth involving a nurse who decided to clean the dentures of the entire ward but made the mistake of putting them all in one big 